kind of bring a few things back to the forefront of your understanding uh, before we move on here. We're going to look at transformations of sine and cosine because those are the ones that you can most easily model real situations. Any kind of thing that happens to be periodic, whether it's, think about, you know, you've, you've used other kinds of functions to model real things. In grade 10, you did a lot with straight lines and you modeled real situations, something that increases over time or, or any one of a number of things. You worked with uh, quadratic functions in grade 11 and you might have modeled something with that, the height of a projectile or, or something or other. So we're going to use sine and cosine functions. You just have to think about, you know, what, what kind of things could you model with a graph like that that keeps fluctuating up, down? What kinds of things could you model? you think of any? There's some things that are like this, <laughs> straight lines, but there's some things that fluctuate, go up and down. Anything that has to do with something rotating, uh, the earth rotating, the fact that it's on a, on a bit of a tilt, the average length of the day over the year, right? Uh, we're in the stage of probably about here somewhere, right? The, the day, the number of daylight hours is um, eight or nine or something like that. But then in the summer, it's up, it's up here. Now my scale would be wrong here, but you might have 16 hours of daylight there, but only eight hours of daylight at this point, right? And it changes as the years go by, right? It goes up, down, up, down. But it's a repetitive cycle. Uh, anything to do with that, the, the seasons you could you could model. Um, temp, average temperature over the year. Uh, even, um, I don't know, the, the temperature in your oven. I don't know how you're, if you understand how your oven works, but you turn it on, you set it to, I don't know, 350 or something like that. It doesn't, it doesn't go up to that temperature and then stay perfectly at that temperature. Uh, it, it gets up to a temperature and it kind of fluctuates like this because the oven, you know, the element inside can only be on or off. So it goes above the, temperature you want. This might be kind of the temperature you want here, which is, I don't know, 350 degrees. It goes above the temperature you want, and then it says, you know, the thermostat says, well, you better turn off because it's too hot. Gets too cold, turns back on, heats up. That's how your, you know, your house works as well. It kind of fluctuates around a temperature. It might not be a perfect uh, sinusoidal kind of curve like that. But, but anything, uh, anything that is a repetitive cycle like that, you can often model with sine and cosine functions. So that's where we're going in this unit. We need to remember how to, how to uh, first of all, graph the basic function uh, for each of these. Do you remember what the basic graphs look like? Maybe you, could, maybe you could right now try and draw a graph for yourself after your long weekend. Uh, draw a graph of each one and then fill in the information here. And I will pause this and then maybe you're not quite sure of some of these words. Amplitude, period. Once you draw the graph on there, this is actually how I would draw a sign curve. Don't just try and draw a freehand sort of thing like this. Use some reference points. You know that it starts at zero, right? Sign of zero is zero. And as you do one complete rotation, right? You go all the way around to two pi it hits the same value again because it's repetitive like that. Now halfway in between there, because it's symmetric, it's going to hit that point again. Whoops, I missed over here. There's 2 pi. Halfway in between those two, it's at pi again. What happens to the values for the first half of this rotation? They start at, they start at 0 here. Remember that sine, if you have a point that's on the end of a terminal arm and it's rotating around, the sine of the angle that this, you know, this angle here, the sine of that angle is related to the y coordinate. So what happens to the values of sine as you go around here up to 90 degrees? What happens to the values of sine as you go from 0 to 90? They start at 0 and what happens? They go up, they go down, they stay the same. What happens? They increase, right? They increase to a maximum of 1, halfway there. Okay. So if you want to draw the curve, it looks something like that as best you can. Note, notice that it doesn't go straight up and straight down. It's not like a saw teeth. And it's not, it's not a semicircle kind of thing like that. It, it's, not, it's not a curve that is completely vertical in the middle. If you want to get it fairly accurate, you probably should know that, well, there's pi over 2, but 
pi over 6, you know what the sine of pi over 6 is, I hope. It's one of those exact value triangles. Do you know what the sine of pi over 6 is? Remember your exact triangles here? There's a 1 root 3, 2 triangle. There's pi over 6. What's the sine of that? There's the opposite. There's the hypotenuse. So what is it? A half, right? This is one of the ones we have to know. But, you know, maybe you know that, but you haven't made the connection with where it fits in the graph. If that's one, then if you want as a reference point, you can kind of make sure it goes through that correct point. I'm a little bit too high on that side. Right? Because at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6, it's going to be at a half. If, you know, right now maybe that's not, we're not up to that point of being able to be that accurate and you're just using these five kind of reference points to draw your curve, that's fine too, okay? Uh, we need the other half of it here. Uh, I'm going to use these points just to get it right. Oops. It does keep going. Don't, don't draw it as stopping at those points, right? It keeps going and it's repetitive. Now, so essentially what we're doing in this in this unit is going to be doing the different transformations that you know about, right? We're going to be doing things like this, compressing it and expanding it vertically. We're going to be compressing it and expanding it horizontally. And we're going to be, what are the other two? What? What would you say? Something? I didn't hear. You're going to tell me one I'm not able to do on here, right? There's one I can't do with this. I can move it up and down, yeah. I can move it up and down. And I can move it side to side, right? So there's that, but there's one that it doesn't easily do. What are the other types of things? Yeah, the reflections, right? So you can imagine reflections. Um, now, the reflections aren't going to be actually too big with this because since it's repetitive, it's hard to tell if it's reflected or not. Like if you if you uh, if you take something that has this repetitive pattern like this and you reflect it, it's actually just going to be kind of like that, and you're not. Even, it's going to be hard to even tell that you reflected it. It might just look like you've shifted it. So the big ones are going to be the the four: the vertical shift, horizontal shift, horizontal compression or expansion and vertical compression or expansion. One of them is sort of more difficult and I have it separated as a second thing here. We're going to do all of them except for the horizontal compressions and expansions first because this one's tough, not because it's a more difficult concept, but because of the scale here involved. Um, the scale and the horizontal axis is pi fractions and it becomes kind of confusing for people. So we, we look at that one separately. Anyways, for the basic graph here of sine, the period is 2 pi because that's the length, that's this length right here. Okay, the period is 2 pi. It means the pattern repeats every 2 pi. If we continued this graph, it would be another 2 pi and another 2 pi and so on. The amplitude is the distance from this center line to the top or that center line to the bottom. So the amplitude there is... One. When we expand it and compress it vertically, the amplitude will change. The maximum is one. The minimum is negative one. My ones aren't looking all that hot. I better redraw them. Okay, the maximum just meaning the highest it goes. Minimum just meaning the lowest it goes. If you know the max and the min, you know the, the range. It has to be between there. Sometimes you might write it instead of with y in the middle. You might say sine x is between, there, right? The values of sine have to be between negative 1 and 1, inclusive. They can't be larger than that. The domain here, if this graph keeps going, what's the domain? What x values does it cover? Yeah, everything, right? All real numbers. A lot of that information is the same here for cosine. In fact, every single one of them is the same. If you draw the graph for cosine, the only difference is kind of where it starts in the cycle. Cosine follows the x-coordinates, as we hopefully know. 
in the recesses of our mind somewhere. As you rotate around x coordinate, y coordinate, cosine follows the x coordinate. So it starts at 1. With an angle of 0, it starts at 1. And then, of course, that means it has to, 2 pi later, also be back at 1. If you're drawing a cosine curve, I would put those two points. I would put one down here and then draw the ones in the middle. And then fill it in. Don't do this. Draw the exact same shape as before. It's, it's going to go down like that, over there, up like that, and like that. And it's going to keep going, right? It doesn't stop at those points. 